So our final speaker is Olivier Humbert from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Centre in Seattle, and the title of his talk is Transplantation and Persistence of CRISPR-Cas9 Edited Hemopoietic Stem and Progenitor Cells for the Reactivation of Fetal Hemoglobin in Non-Human Primates. It's a real pleasure to be presenting at the Presidential Symposium today, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Olivier Ambert. I am from Hans Peter Kim's lab at the Fred Hutch in Seattle. And today I will talk about novel therapeutic options for uh, the treatment of hemoglobinopathies based on genome editing of hematopoietic stem cells. And so as we know, sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia are causing uh, high rates of mortality and morbidity worldwide. But there is one factor that is known to alleviate the severity of this disease, which is the expression of high levels of fetal hemoglobin. And this is illustrated in this graph where, where we are seeing increased survival of sickle cell patients who express high level of fetal hemoglobin. But in most adults, uh, fetal hemoglobin is only gonna be found at levels of less than 1%. And this is because uh, the gamma globin expression, which is shown in, in this diagram, is downregulated after birth and replaced with beta globin expression. And so there has been um, a lot of interest in the field to uh, increase uh, the level of fetal hemoglobin uh, as therapeutic for hemoglobinopathies. And this can now be done genetically with uh, the genome editing tools that have become available recently, and there has been at least two approaches to go after this. The first approach is to inactivate uh, the known repressor of fetal hemoglobin called BCL11A. Another approach has been to try to recapitulate uh, natural mutations found in individuals who continue to express high level of fetal hemoglobin throughout lives. Uh, these individuals have a benign genetic condition known as HPFH. And so for our study, we were specifically interested in a 13 nucleotide deletion that is highlighted here, found in the promoter region of the gamma globin gene. Proof of pro concept experiments have already been carried out in adult cells to show that the targeting of this region can reactivate fetal hemoglobin. And this either has been done using CRISPR-Cas9 or using um, uh, TAL nucleases as described by uh, Chris Lux and our collaborator at Seattle Children. And so our goal was really to uh, continue to expand on these studies and to determine the potential of hematopoietic stem cells that have been edited at these HPFH sites after transplantation. So to answer this question, we have used the non-human primate model, which the Kim lab has optimized over the last couple of years. We find that this model has very interesting advantages because it reproduces, um, it closely reproduces parameters from human studies and also allows for the long-term uh, monitoring of engraftment and hemoglobin production. So we started by optimizing condition for the efficient editing of non-human primate CD34 cells. And we have used uh, electroporation for delivery of CRISPR ribonucleoprotein to these cells. And after op optimization, we were generally able to achieve about 70 to 75% editing efficiency in these cells, which we have measured by next generation sequencing. Uh, these data also allowed us to look at the deletion profile in these cells, which we have represented in the form of a bar graph that you can see here, where each color box shows a, a unique type of deletion. And so as expected, we found small deletion within, within the CRISPR uh, target site that range from one to six nucleotide. But we also found a large frequency of a 30 nucleotide deletion that is an exact match for the natural HPFH deletion. And this is consistent with data from uh, human cells and is likely due to an efficient uh, repair pathway 
that uses microhomology and is known as microhomology mediating and mediated and joining. We also found that all of these deletions are located within a BCL11A binding site that was very recently characterized. And so we started by transplanting a cohort of three resus macaques using the, the protocol uh, that you can see in this slide, where CD34 cells were enriched from the bone marrow of these animals, electroporated with CRISPR ribonucleoprotein, and then infused back in the animal that was treated by myeloablative conditioning. And in this table, I'm showing you the number of CD34 cells that had to be edited uh, for each animal that range from 90 to 144 million cells. And just to reiterate, in these experiments, we were especially interested in tracking both editing efficiency in vivo as well as fetal hemoglobin reactivation. And so these are the editing uh, data from all three transplanted animals. Uh, we have measured uh, editing from peripheral blood sample of these animals over time using next generation sequencing. And you can see that after about a month post transplantation, editing levels uh, have, have stabilized for almost a year post transplantation and ranged at levels um, from 15% all the way to 35%. We also looked at the deletion profile in one of the three animals over time. And this is again uh, shown in the form of the bar graph. And you can see that all deletions are persisting for at least 234 days in this animal, including the 30 nucleotide deletion on top. So the next step was to uh, evaluate fetal hemoglobin reactivation in this animal. And we have done that by staining red blood cells expressing fetal hemoglobin, and then these are known as F cells. And in, da in data that we published recently, we found that the transplantation procedure in itself results in a transient induction of circulating F cells. And this is illustrated in this graph uh, where we are looking at several con control transplants that shows a transient increase in circulating F cells which eventually go back to basal levels. So in comparison, the three animals treated with a CRISPR, which I just described, show uh, substantially higher levels of um, circulating F cells uh, after, um, and those levels stabilized after six months post-transplantation. And we were happy to see that the levels of circulating F cells that were achieved in this animal correlated nicely with the in vivo editing levels. So we were encouraged by these results, but uh, those experiments also made us uh, face some challenges that are associated with the manipulation and the editing of a large number of cells. And this is a, a challenge that is generally encountered in the field of gene therapy uh, that requires uh, a large amount of CRISPR reagents as well as a large-scale electroporation device. And so to get around this issue, our laboratory recently characterized a refined CD90 positive subset within the CD34 population that was found to be responsible for both short-term and long-term engraftment in the non-human primate model. And this, this has largely been the work of Stefan Radke, who presented his newest data early this week. And so using these uh, different approaches, we modified our transplantation protocol, which consisted first in the sorting of the CD90 positive subset from the CD90 negative cells. And we only edited the, uh, the CD90 positive subset in this experiment. And you can see in this table that the number of cells that had to be edited was reduced by more than tenfold and ran from 10 to 14 million per animal. But I want to point out that at the time of infusion, we combined the edited CD90 positive subset with the non-edited CD90 negative cells. 
But before we did the transplantation experiment, we wanted to verify that this CD90 positive subset could efficiently be edited. And so we have carried a few in vitro experiments where we sorted out uh, the CD90 positive subset and the CD90 negative subset. We edited each one of these subsets individually, but when we measure editing, we found comparable levels of editing um, between the CD34 cell and the CD90 positive subset. So we transplanted another cohort of three rhesus macaque using this CD90 positive transplantation approach. And um, I'm sh first showing you here the levels of editing that was achieved in this animal, which is, is shown in red as compared to the CD34 animal shown in blue. And you can see um, a very comparable level of in vivo editing that was achieved in those animals as compared to the previous cohort. And again, this was done by only editing less than 10% of the cells um, as compared to the CD34 cohort. We also measure circulating F cells and again found a, a very similar response to the previous cohort I described and levels of uh, circulating F cells that was achieved in, in these animals correlated with in vivo editing data. So finally, we wanted to determine whether the edited hematopoietic stem cells could come back to the bone marrow. And so we sampled the, the bone marrow of two animals per cohort at six months post-transplantation, and we measured editing efficiency in both the CD34 cells and the CD90 positive subset of the bone marrow. And we, you're looking uh, at the CD34 cohorts on the left and the CD90 cohort on the right. But basically, we found substantial level of editing in both CD34 cells and CD90 positive subset in all animals. And the levels that were detected were really comparable to what was observed from uh, editing levels detected in the blood of the same animals. We also measured uh, editing levels in the different lineages, again from the bone marrow, and we found substantial levels of editing in myeloid, erythroid, and lymphocytic lineages in all animals, indicating that we were really able to efficiently edit uh, multipotent stem cells and that the stem cells could come back to the bone marrow. So just to quickly summarize the data presented to you today, I first showed you the persistence and multilineage engraftment of hematopoietic stem cells that were edited at the HPFH site. And so far we have followed this animal for almost a year, but we are planning to continue uh, to monitor them. We have also validated a novel transplantation protocol that is based on the editing on, of a refined CD90 positive fraction. And this novel protocol allowed us to achieve the same, uh, um, the same result for in vivo editing while reducing the number of cells that had to be edited by over tenfold. And finally, I have showed you in all animals that uh, we were able to reactivate uh, fetal hemoglobin with levels uh, reaching 30% of fetal, 30% um, of circulating F cells, which, are, which is within therapeutic reach. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people who have contributed to this project, and Spidoc Kim for the opportunity to work on such impactful projects. I want to thank Stefan Radke and Ray Carrillo from the Kim Lab, who have uh, been major contributor of this project. I would like to thank Jenna Day on our lab for valuable discussion. Uh, people who have done a great job taking care of those animals. Our collaborator at Seattle Children with Andy Scheinberg and David Rawlings Lab. Um, Olivia Negre at Blooper Bio for HPN HPLC analysis of these animals that I didn't have time to show you. And Gang Bowers Lab at RISE for off target site analysis. And thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, perhaps I could start by asking how you're planning to translate this clinically. What would your development pathway be? Well, the first step will be to uh, continue to monitor those animals. Mm -hmm. We are planning to follow them for at least two years. 
uh, post-transplant and ensure that the levels of uh, editing uh, are really stabilizing for that long. Um, we are also um, going to um, continue to work on HPLC analysis to really get a qualitative measurement of phenol hemoglobin uh, because at this point we are measuring circulating F cells but we are not really determining how much phenol hemoglobin per cells is being produced. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, the, the transplantation approach that we have developed here is going to be amenable to any time of any type of uh, editing using different targets. So in the long term, we'll just uh, choose the most potent target. Okay. okay, well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank you and actually all the speakers for outstanding talks that I think really reflect the diversity of activity in the society. Thank you.